She won most talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, let's bring everybody up to speed, Mariah. In 2022, let's make it the year of good manners and good etiquette. And yes. I know that's your passion. I love <laughs> your social media and we're linking all that in the show notes. But tell Thank me you. some things people really need to do because we're looking into the summer months. Let's just talk mm-hmm. about summer etiquette. Where do we start? In terms of summer etiquette, well, I mean, we can get to the real basics, right? That the seasonless etiquette of just being a good person, right? Leading with kindness and respect for everyone. But I think as we get into the summer, there's plenty of things we can talk about with vacations and, you know, beach etiquette and just being mindful of of other people when you're out doing all of your summer activities. Okay. So what is the rule? Now, uh, in Arkansas, we go to uh, Florida for our beach time. You, of course, mm-hmm. go to the eastern seaboard, eastern shore. Mm-hmm. Uh, what? Mm-hmm. I wonder if the etiquette's any different. So when you're staking out your spot, do you <laughs> grab your chair? Do you uh, hike your leg and pee on it? Or do you put your <laughs> name on it? What do you do? So in Jersey, we bring all of our own gear to the beach, at least where I grew up going to the beach. So you sort of pick your, your spot enough of a ways away from the other, you know, people enjoying their time so that you're giving them their space. Of course, it's public shared space. But we want to be mindful of sitting on top of other people and right. mindful of the the noise that we'll be creating and all that stuff. So I think that where I grew up, you would just put your chair and towels and cooler and umbrella and whatever else you had and in a spot that's enough of a distance away from the person in front of you, behind you, to the left, to the right. And then when you're shaking out your towel, you don't want to get all your uh, your, your germies on the nice people from Jersey sitting next to you, or the nice Absolutely. people from Arkansas. So what's the most, uh, the safest way in this um, virus season that we always talk about? What's the mm-hmm. safest way and most appropriate way to get that towel cleaned and get the kids cleaned up before you go back to the condo? I try and walk as far away from other people as possible and also be mindful of the wind because just because you're standing far enough from someone, you know, same thing when you're spraying sunscreen, you may think that it's going directly on you, but the beach gets windy. So you have to be mindful of the wind as well in terms of sunscreen and towels. And so I try and walk away as far as I can before I shake my towel out. Or honestly, I'll just bring a bag that I'm okay with having sand in and just roll up the towel, stick it in my bag, and then shake the bag out with the towel when I get closer to the the boardwalk. Because sand is inevitable. It's the beach. It, it is. <laughs> as much as we as much as we try right. and keep it away, it's certainly right. inevitable. Right. Okay. If we talk about traveling, mm-hmm. there was my husband the other day um flew and left Little Rock and he often because he travels so much for his business, he's in medical sales, it's um he gets bumped up to first class all the time. So, but he was not wearing what I would call first class attire. He was in like his workout pants and, you know, a zip up jacket. And I just went back in the day, you couldn't get into first class Mm -hmm. unless you, a man had a coat and tie on. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the, what are the rules now for traveling and the person who gets bumped up the first class, if you're wearing that, now he gets bumped up because he has so many miles. But if you're trying to get bumped up, trying to appease the staff, you got to wear wear nicer than your, um, you know, MC Hammer pants and your <laughs> shirt from the 90s. I'm really glad you brought this up. This is something that I'm very passionate about. You know, I think traveling is, is a luxury. And it's, it is. Although it's more common nowadays and flying is... You know, you don't have to think twice about it and everybody can fly. You still want to be able to present yourself in the right way to show respect to the staff, show respect to the people sitting around you. And so I, it really bothers me when people wear pajamas, whether you are in first class, business class, economy, no matter where you're sitting, you should be presenting yourself in a way that you would any day, really, and then take pride in your appearance that doesn't mean you don't have to be, you know, you should still be comfortable, but there's a way to do that while still having pride in your self-presentation. Okay. Then we have to talk about taking the shoes off when you're on the plane. Mm -hmm. Why people think they need to take their shoes off and put them near me uh, is beyond me. But how do we handle that as a traveler? If someone is doing something next to you, that is really offensive. 
So that's a sticky situation because technically it's poor etiquette to point out somebody's poor etiquette. (gasps) Oh, whoops. Mm. But (laughs) on the other hand, you know, we still have to set boundaries for ourselves and make sure that, you know, we're safe and comfortable in what we're doing. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, if someone takes their shoes off and it they enter your space and your seat to just ask if they could kindly just move them over back to to their space. I wouldn't recommend saying, you know, please put your shoes on. That would probably be something that would be reserved for the the airplane staff, which if it got to that point where yeah. it became a serious issue, that's I would recommend just bringing them into the situation, letting them take care of it. That's what they're there for. Okay, get the seat reclining. Mm-hmm. I, I have the right to recline my seat, don't I? You do. Technically, if we're being very, very technical, it's improper etiquette. You should not recline your seat. Then why do they give me the option? <laughs> well, I, I think that it's that's if we're being really, really technical, right? And we're following the 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 old school rules. But I think that, like you said, you're you're given the ability to do it. So most people don't know that it's not proper etiquette and they're not doing it to disturb the person behind them, right? It's all about you know, thinking about the other people, right? And if we're if everybody's reclining, why shouldn't we, right? It's it's right. That's, we're hoping that the airplanes are created so that even if we yeah. do recline, we're not getting so much into the person's personal space behind us. Well, as we know, airplane seats have gotten smaller, mm-hmm. and they're packing more people in, so oh, yes. it's it's not as comfortable to fly, and it it's you know travel used to be more luxurious. Right. Yes, I mean, we know that. Absolutely. I mean, they, they were fed, fed, you know, three meals <clears throat> going from New York to LA. And now you don't, it, now you think you get a bag of peanuts. <laughs> yes. It was very glamorous. I mean, people, like you mentioned before, people were dressed to the nines. <laughs> it was a big, it was a big outing to go on an airplane back in yeah. the day. I, right. a part of me wishes it was still, I know. it was still like that. I do. I do love when I see people dressed up in the airport. I really respect that. Yeah, me too. Uh, you may be too young, but there was a time people smoked on airplanes. <laughs> That's crazy. Is that not insane? There were smoking, Mariah, and non-smoking sections. We're packed into In the an same airplane plane. <laughs> with circulating air. It is all smoking. And since I've never been a smoker, I remembered once they would, that a light would come on saying, you can now smoke, which really, who thought this was a good idea? Wow. And you would either hear a lighter... Mm-hmm. Or now you don't hear a lighter, but when you hear the seatbelt click, it get, it it triggers people like me to think, oh my gosh, is someone, is that a lighter again? <laughs> because we hated it. If you're not a smoker, you know, you don't like the smell of it. It Absolutely. Bo- I, 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 it bothers every fiber in your being. So it does Absolutely. sometimes I hear that sound going, oh, is that a lighter? No, it's not. It's not a lighter. And you can't um, get a more contained space than that. I mean, without the air no. circulation. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. No, it's insane. And, you know, really, COVID has really divided people, not just on, you know, health issues, but airplanes. Something has happened to our manners in the last two years. Mm -hmm. I'm saying COVID because that's what's on our calendar that we can all look back on our iPhones and go, oh, yeah, that was COVID. And that's when it seems like etiquette or decorum or or respect for your fellow man. I mean, and I think people are just angst and wound up. But what do you think has happened? Have you noticed that? Or maybe it's, you know, I'm, I'm following accounts that show passenger shaming mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yes. What is your thought on the way things have changed? I absolutely think that it's, you know, the stress of, of what we've all been through. And not that that gives anybody any excuse to misbehave or treat someone without respect. But I, I do have a friend that's a flight attendant and I've spoken to her about this a few times where she has said that it's been exceptionally brutal and and significantly worse than it's ever been in her, you know, how many ever years that she's been a flight attendant of just people lacking the social awareness and the basic, basic, basic manners of just treating other people with respect. And I think a lot of that comes with disagreements on different topics, right? So yeah. if we if we talk about the 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 mask situation yeah, oh, and sure. if a flight attendant were to ask someone to please leave their mask on and then they argue back. And so it's it's kind of the getting back to the basics of just just even if you don't necessarily agree with something, it's the rules of the airline that you've chosen yes. to book with. And so as a as a 
proper citizen, you should be following those rules and respecting, you know, the their goal of keeping everyone safe, whether or not you agree with it. Right. Well, flying is a privilege, not a right. Absolutely. So the, and they, the way they run their business, they can ask you to leave the airplane. And that's yes. what I hated. I saw after the mask got lifted and I was cheering mm-hmm. it with everybody, but mm-hmm. I saw the flight attendant saying, thank you, especially from us, because they're the ones that had the brunt of yes. the pushback from people. Yes. They didn't want to wear a mask. I mean, no one, no one. I mean, I know I say that I can't make a blanket statement, but most people didn't want to, don't want to travel anywhere and wearing masks. If you choose mm-hmm. to, that's great. But they were the ones that had to execute something that they were to keep their job. They were trying right. to do. Right. So just following it, the rules. Yeah. It just, it made it um, very uncomfortable for all. It's just been an unusual, you know, obviously situation the last two years. I feel like we've kind of lifted out of some of that mask lifting and everything. Yes. Um, which is a good thing. Okay. Let me try to think of anything else on the airplane. Oh, bathroom. Should we uh, wipe down the sink and the vanity after we've used it? In, in an airplane? In an airplane. Yeah. I usually do anywhere that I am once I have, if, you know, if a paper towel is available and it's not yeah. an air dryer. Um, I'll be honest, I am like the biggest motion sick, worst flyer person Mm -hmm. to ever exist. So when I'm in that restroom on the airplane, I am like trying to go in and out as fast as I can. But of course, still trying to be mindful that others are going to be using the restroom after me. Yeah. Kids in flying, you know, that's a tough one. No one wants Mm -hmm. to sit by the family with the 10 ducks behind them, you know? Absolutely. Um, and again, I guess you can't... you know, now when flights are so packed, you can't used to, you could move your seat. You mm-hmm. could say, can, can I sit up there? And they'd mm-hmm. say, sure. <laughs> and now. That doesn't really exist anymore. No. I so, think that it all goes back to really the, like I mentioned before, the basics of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, just simple respect for others. Obviously, if, you know, a child is acting up or yelling, even if it's bothering you, which of course, it's maybe not the optimal situation when you're stuck on an airplane, but you don't know, you know, their background and I'm sure they're doing their best. And so just don't roll your eyes. Don't, you know, stare. Just just try and mind your own business and put yourself in their shoes. And, you know, just, just going back to being a, a good and understanding person. Yeah, we've lost some of our empathy, I think, the last couple of years. Yes, absolutely. Um, Let's segue into wedding season because that's Mm -hmm. hot upon us. Uh, Boy, a lot has changed. I I think some days Emily Post Post is rolling in her grave. (laughs) I'm sure sure she is. It's not the way, you know, I still have my (laughs) engraved, you know, Crane's paper, you know, here Mm -hmm. with my name on it and something. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Used to, you only had engraved invitations. Now, you know, Emily Post would never allow you to have it embossed or printed. No. Yes. Or heaven forbid, text or email somebody. Oh my goodness. A wedding <laughs> she doesn't even want to hear that. <laughs> no, no. So a lot has changed. So I'm trying to think where to even begin. Okay. Let's talk about the, the wedding invitation. Mm-hmm. That has changed a lot. Um, but what can you have on your wedding in- invitation? Do you need to have your mom and dad presenting you? What if they're divorced what if they're mm-hmm. remarried? What if there's mm-hmm. a bad relationship with dad? How do you just handle the first part of that? Whose name goes on the invitation in, I'm saying, the traditional bride situation? Mm-hmm. So I think that in modern times, there are a lot less rules and people are a lot, you know, they're more receptive of different options, whether it comes to the invitation, it comes to the way they're planning their specific events. And so I think that traditionally when, you know, both parents would be presenting their daughter to be the bride, to be married, I think now it depends on your individual situation and it's okay to, you know, to, to do what works for your family. So if that means that, you know, mom and dad are divorced, maybe you put them on separate lines. Maybe if, you know, mom is presenting the or hosting the wedding and dad's not involved at all, you don't put him on the wed, on the invitation at all. So right. I think it's it's less about doing it the formal way that it used to be. And that comes, you know, I'm a traditionalist in that sense. I love, you know, keeping traditions like that alive. But I think now it's it depends on everyone's individual situation. We all live different lives. 
Okay, in addressing the invitation, there was a time that if she was an unmarried woman, you would put MS period and mm-hmm. Smith. Mm-hmm. Is that still a term we use, Ms. period, to signify a woman who is unmarried? I recommend that. I recommend using Ms. if it's an adult woman that you know is unmarried or you're not sure. So if I'm ever sending a letter a letter or an invitation out to somebody where I'm unsure of their marital status, I will use Ms. Ms. is really only reserved for young, young ladies. And... Mrs. Someone taught me years ago that I, mm-hmm. this is how she said it for me. I'm only Mrs. If I have my husband's name, I'm Mrs. Chris Fisher, but I'm Ms. Lisa Fisher. If so, when we're sending me something, inviting me, let's say to a wedding shower, is that still the rule in 2022? I use Mrs. For all married and widowed women. So even in using my first name, Mrs. Mm-hmm. Lisa Fisher. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, this, and then again, I would also use, I would also use misses if you know if if the woman is divorced and they I know that then I would not use misses I would use Ms. even if they're okay. still taking okay. their ex-husband's last yes. name just because I like to think of how they would receive it right yeah. if they're not married anymore even if they're keeping their ex-husband's last name they don't want to be referred to as a missus right right I they, would see so that. yes. that's that's kind of how I I try and think of it is how when this person you know views the invitation how will they they receive it yes and not ever wanting to offend anyone, not knowing someone's preference. Of course. Which could get us into some other issues, but I can't, I, my mind won't even let me go to <laughs> a certain things. So I'm yes. going to try to stay on target. Um, so that's the invitation. Now, when you're writing the thank you note, I was always mm-hmm. taught, again, this was in the 80s and 90s, um, because I studied some etiquette under some a lady here in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. If I were, if someone were writing me a thank you note, my husband and I gave them a gift. Mm -hmm. And the lady said, but we know, Lisa, you're the one who bought the gift. She said, I would address it to Mr. or Mrs. Chris Fisher, but inside I would put, dear Lisa, thank you so much for the towel set you gave me. Love, Sally. What is it now when you're writing the thank you note? Because Mm -hmm. my husband's not, he doesn't even know we bought a wedding gift, (laughs) right? You know, he has no idea, except there's a thank you note. How is that addressed? I would put both of your names inside the thank you note. Again, no, you with, with keeping in mind modern etiquette and ever That's changing, true. you know, ways that we have now, I can't assume that you were the one that purchased That's the true. gift. In my family, everybody listening, if you're getting something from me, it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> my husband well, has no I, idea. <laughs> right. In fact, when he was flying. my family. <laughs> Right. When he was flying the other day, he happened to, because Arkansas, we're a small town. Our Mm -hmm. friends uh, live in Manhattan, but they're getting married in Arkansas next month. And Mm -hmm. before he left that morning, I said, hey, I need a commitment. I need to RSVP this wedding. Can you go? Because I knew I was, because I'm going. I'm an extrovert. I'm going to all the parties, right? (laughs) And he goes, "Mm, let me think about it. Okay, I'll go. So he saw them as he was getting onto the plane. I said, lucky you. I had RSVP'd it. The deadline is like in two days. I said, Mm -hmm. RSVP'd it. So it wasn't an awkward situation. He was like, yeah, it wouldn't have been awkward for me. He goes, I didn't (laughs) know that was a thing. I go, oh, it's so a thing. They would have been wondering, why didn't you RSVP? Which that has changed and that now Mm -hmm. we can do um, our correspondence at the not.com, you know, rather than sending a note. Absolutely. But I think even though that we're, you know, with the times of the electronic wedding websites or evites for other events, the RSVP is still just as important as it was when it first was invented. <laughs> and for everybody listening, I'll tell you why. It comes down to the dala dala make you holla. Mm-hmm. People want to know if you're not coming, they're not spending a hundred dollars for your plate. I mean, it it just goes down to money and we had this when my daughter got married, it was in 2015 and she was young. Mm -hmm. She was about almost 23. And so her peers had just graduated college and they, we kind of had her in charge of just, you know, getting the RSVPs from her friends because my Mm -hmm. friends had already replied. Right. And hers didn't because she said, mom, no one does that. Mm -hmm. And then, so we bought a whole lot more food, you know, assuming (laughs) they would be there. Right then showed up and we all ate it for two days until we threw Mm -hmm. it out. So it's made her, it's the impetus for her that anytime she gets a note now that says RSVP, she goes, I reply immediately because I know they're waiting. People, Mm -hmm. when you have a party, you're just waiting. You're wanting to know numbers. It's 
not out of rudeness. It's not out of any exclusivity. It's mm-hmm. nothing other than, do I need to buy a plate of dinner for you? Right. Just preparation. And I think that those are, you know, RSVP is one of those very simple etiquette ideas that is lost in my generation. And I think that as simple as it is, even if an invitation does not require an RSVP, for example, uh, right. a text invitation to a dinner yeah. party or a yeah. luncheon, as you're, as a guest, it's still your responsibility to let the host know whether or not you'll be attending, even if it doesn't specifically note that an RSVP is required. Okay. Everybody listening, stop your recorder, rewind it and bring it back. I want her, I want you to hear what Mariah just said, because it is just because I, I, as an extrovert, like to host a lot of parties mm-hmm. and I am wondering a lot of times going, I need head count and, you know, people that play, I'm not a party planner, I'm a party giver. So my party yes. planners help me with that and yes. remind me what the statistics are and the numbers and who's come, you know, about if you invite this many, this many will show. So, right. Because I, I have had too much food in my day <laughs> as well. Okay, now for the thank you note from the bride and groom. Mm-hmm. I was always taught that the gifts were given to the bride in traditional mm-hmm. settings, of course, mm-hmm. and that the thank you note only had the bride's name because he's not signing it. Has that mm-hmm. changed? Yes. A lot <gasps> of tradition. Yeah, I know. <gasps> and you know what? I think that the good thing about modern etiquette is that if you want to, you kind of can can pick and choose. If you want to do it that traditional way, it's yeah. okay, but it's also acceptable for you, you know, maybe there's two brides, maybe there's two grooms, maybe that's there, true. you know, maybe yeah. the maybe the groom was very involved in the the registry, you know, yeah, that's true. choosing. And so it's it's important for them both to be to be on the thank you know if they want to be. Okay. Does he need do they both need to sign it because their names are on the front of the card? That's that's a good question. I don't think that that would be totally necessary if one of them is just I do. writing it and but <laughs> and just putting, you know, you know, from, you know, thank you, love this or from this, you know, both of their names. But again, you're talking to someone who's who's a from a younger generation or but who's very yeah. traditional. Yeah. So I personally, if I was signing the card from you know me and my future husband, I would have us both sign it. Um, or even I would just sign it, but I think that there's there's a lot of leeway now. I there's know. a lot more that's acceptable now, especially when it comes to wedding etiquette, because you know, so much things has have changed. changed. Yeah, mm-hmm. the landscape has changed. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's another argument. Old schoolers like me, my monogram on my mm-hmm. towels is my first name, my maiden name, mm-hmm. my maiden initial, and my mm-hmm. current last name. Mm-hmm. Well, now. These kids are doing her initial, his initial, and the shared last name. Or what if there are two names? No one changes. How do you do that if if no one if you're keeping maiden names and all that? How do you do those things? You just put the last initial. (laughs) You get Uh, bath towels that just have a have an F on them. No, no. I mean that's my that's like my simple recommendation. If it gets complicated, but yes, the traditional way to do the monogram would be would be the way you stated originally, because again, people keep their middle names, drop their middle names, you know, keep their maiden names, don't change your last name at all. So I was being, you know, a little funny when I said, just use the last initial and call it a day, but no, I'm with you. (laughs) It gets really, really hairy when it comes to multiple, multiple names in a, in a three piece monogram. It it gets really confusing. So then for the person, okay. Then if, Oh, what about hyphenated names? What if your last name is, you know, whatever, Smith Sanderson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I would take, so if it was, let's just for for example purposes to make it easy, if it was one person creating the monogram and their name was like, for example, Mary Alice Rose Smith, I would take out the Rose and just use Mary Alice and Smith because- there's only three letters for you to create that monogram. So if you were to have a couple with a hyphenated last name, I would just drop, you know, either the maiden name, if you were using the maiden name or whatever that extra in between name was, I would drop. If that makes sense. Yes. In the South, we often use uh, double names. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a Southern thing. So I have a daughter who's Anna Margaret Fisher. Mm -hmm. And she has said when, when I get married, what will my monogram be? Will I be Anna Fisher so-and-so or Anna Margaret 
Smith. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I don't know. What it, what is it? Do you, well, sh- that's the same case. You were said you would drop the rose. You would use the first name, the last. Is, is that her middle, is Margaret her middle name or is it, is her, is her, fir- is her full name Anna Margaret? No, it's two names. It's Anna Margaret Fisher. Mm-hmm. So I would probably mm-hmm. drop the Margaret. Does she just go by Anna or she goes by Anna Margaret? Well, now, because she's a model, she has a new name. She goes by Margot, uh-huh. but we're not. That, that's a whole family <laughs> battle. We don't, when they say, oh, your daughter's Margot Fisher, we go, no. Our daughter's <laughs> Anna Margaret Fisher, because we're mean parents. But yes, in pr- privately with her friends and family, she's still Anna Margaret. Two names. Okay. Two names. So then I would probably, I would, mm, I think that would be up to her whether she won. It was okay. more important for her to have her maiden name or more important for her to have both have of her. Both names. I would say if she, if she took her husband's last name and she prefers to go by her two names, I would drop the Fisher. Okay. Got it. And that is really the reason she said she changed her social media handle and her agents. Mm-hmm. When you're a model, you have like a mother agency and then you have other agencies that represent mm-hmm. you, New York, Miami, Dallas, wherever. Um, mm-hmm. She said in other markets, double names aren't part of the norm, mm-hmm. you know, outside the South. And mm-hmm. it was too many words. And she said, I never want to be just Anna. She said, mm-hmm. so it just got to be Margot. So she really does use Margot. Um, in professional situations because it's she like said her it's stage easier. name. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It totally is. And so we're like, get back on your stage because here in the house, you're Anna Margaret or when your family sees you. <laughs> but it's funny when she's with her friends, they go, who's Anna Margaret? And we're like, that Margot, that's Anna Margaret. Aww. So it is one of those family because she was named after her grandmother, Anna Margaret mm-hmm. Fisher. Mm-hmm. And we didn't think Meemaw sounded good. So we called her Anna Margaret Fisher. <laughs> um, okay. So you're invited. You, you get... Oh, this is also graduation season. Wow, what an appropriate mm-hmm. time to have you yes, on. Yes, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yes, uh, graduation season. I, I just got one from med school today or the other day. Uh, I got two or three for high school graduations. Mm-hmm. I'm old school. I immediately send out a gift. Now mm-hmm. I can send it out electronically because you get, for guys, I get Best Buy cards or Apple gift yes. cards. You know, for yes. women, I still get something monogrammed. Um, is that still so the is, case when, when you get the invitation, mm-hmm. you're, you should send a gift, correct? Is that an invitation or an announcement? Is it an invitation to a party? No, it is announcing that she's getting mm-hmm. her doctor of medicine and mm-hmm. the other two are announcing that they're, the boys are graduating and I had four now, the girls are graduating and they're going to the university of Alabama, going to the mm-hmm. university of Arkansas. Mm-hmm. So they are announcing Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the difference between announcements and invitations. Okay. So an announcement would be exactly what you said, right? Letting, you know, friends and family know of a milestone, of a life change, a move, a baby, graduation. Yes. In in that case, you would send a gift. It is not required to send a gift with an announcement. It's just a kind gesture to do so. It also depends on your relationship. I would recommend sending a small gift if you received an announcement. Now, an invitation would be to an actual event. So if this person was having a graduation party or a luncheon to celebrate their graduation, then you would bring the gift to the event. So that's the difference between the two. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I am. I mean, everybody listening, send me an out announcements because I send out, I mean, I'm (laughs) old school. I just sent out gifts. Where I ran into trouble with that was when... Um, I have three children and one of them, when he graduated high school, one of his classmates sent me maybe an invitation to the mm-hmm. graduation I was going to for my son. Hmm. And they lived like in suck your toe, Arkansas. I drove mm-hmm. out to their home, <laughs> dropped off a gift. And I remember they went, wow, you're getting us a gift. And I didn't say it, Mariah, because I'm being delightful, but I almost said, well, you sent me an invitation or you sent mm-hmm. me an announcement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was an invitation. Cause I remember we didn't send out in invitations. We sent out announcements about our mm-hmm. kids graduating. And I, I felt, I really said, well, it's the right thing to do. I don't remember what I said. Cause then they didn't get a kid gift for my kid. And I drove back mm-hmm. from sucker to Arkansas back into Little Rock <laughs> to my home where I, I said, I would never leave again and drive 25 minutes for a gift for a kid who's at the same graduating class. So in that case, I shouldn't have, I didn't have to send Mm -hmm. a gift because Mm -hmm. I really didn't know the girl very well. Yes. Yes, exactly. 
Exactly. So an announcement is – some people are uncomfortable sending them because they think that it's kind of a a search for a gift, right? It's right. A, it's in that way. Right. But right. I think that if you really kind of understand what an announcement truly is, gifts are not required. Whereas right. an invitation, you don't want to show up to a celebration empty-handed. So that in that case, the gift is required. Okay. Well, that's a good way to put it. And I guess in our family, I really sent out maybe 10 announcements. It was to grandparents so they could put it on, of the, course. Board, you know, on of the refrigerator. Course. And I knew, I mean, I, I they sent them $10 or bought them a hamburger. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. But it was because they like, because, you know, you did the photo with it. You said where mm-hmm. they were going to college, what they were mm-hmm. studying. Mm-hmm. And grandparents kind of like those things. But I did. And I, I think ne- they're, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just never want anyone to think we wanted a gift. Oh, of course. And I think that they're also less common now because of social media. So if you bought a house, now you're taking your, you know, just sold sign and taking a picture in front of it and putting it on Facebook. And so the the announcements are less common because you're now announcing it to your whole community rather than just sending to friends and family, really to let them know what's, that's, that's really the origin of them, right? To let grandparents know. Right. Because there was there wasn't Instagram or instant text yeah. to say, uh-uh. you know, all the news. And so that's that's really where they originated from or the reason behind them. Well then Christmas cards have kind of gone the way of, you know, the carrier pigeon in mm-hmm. that people don't we, I, we get some, but a lot of times you just post it on your social media and your 5,000 friends and 10,000 followers will know something that your insiders know. That's what kind of, I think, slights people, Mariah, is that yes. your insiders are like, well, I can't believe you're sharing this because this, so it's not even special if you're telling everybody. Yes. And I happen to love Christmas cards still. I do too. I do too. <laughs> I, I love I really getting a, a photo of them. I love mm-hmm. getting updates and Sometimes you'll get an epistle from somebody. They'll write a letter, you know. Yes, the whole whole life story. (laughs) Right. Maybe a little bit too much, but I do (laughs) like knowing uh, what people are doing. Okay. So back to weddings then. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm not, let's say I can't make it to your wedding and I've been invited. So I'm not going, I wouldn't be going empty handed. I've always gotten a gift for somebody and sent it. Yes. That's the Is that still the case? Okay. It should be. I think that people don't, but yes, it, it should be. It is correct. Oh, my Emily Post would haunt me. She would personally come and haunt me if I didn't do that because I know, <laughs> I know that uh, way too much. Okay, you're invited. I had uh, I just built a home and I had mm-hmm. um, what I did, what my party event planner thought was a good idea because parking on streets can be precarious sometimes, you know, because we only park on one side because of the way our mm-hmm. street is. So I broke it up into two parties. I had a one to three party for about 40 people. And then I had four to six for 40 people. And Mm -hmm. the hooch was better and the food was better in four to six because it was people leaving work. The one to three were the moms that were going to go pick up their kids and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Well, I, people would ask me because I called it a sip and see. They go, what are Mm -hmm. we sipping and seeing? I said, each other. Because, you know, (laughs) it's kind of a, we're coming out of COVID party too, right? Yeah. So, but I would tell my friends if they text me that, because I sent out obviously printed invitations. Mm -hmm. Of course I did. Of course. Um, But when they would reply, because I did RSVP for gate code, because that way they're like, oh, I in order to get in our street, because it's just a private little street here in in Mm -hmm. Laura get her street. I got to get her cake code. So it, I kind of twisted their arm to do yes. the RSVP, yes. but they would say, is this a housewarming? And I specifically would say no ma'am. And I would tell people no gifts. Mm-hmm. And of course people still bring gifts. I really meant it because mm-hmm. I don't want a bunch of stuff. I'm not mm-hmm. a collector of things. Well, so many people brought things, Mariah, that I don't know who brought what. So I can't write the thank you notes because mm-hmm. people give you the gift when they're coming to your home. Yes. But they still need to put who it's from because then when you have a table of 30 things, so of the 80 people who came or 70 people who came, about ha- thir- let's say 30 brought gifts, mm-hmm. candles, bottles of wine, which were all fine and good, but I kind of got overwhelmed and I haven't written thank you notes. Don't tell Emily Post that either. <laughs> so what was I supposed to have done in that situation? Mm-hmm. I think there are a few things that we can unpack in this situation. So the first thing I want to cover is that if someone asks you to not bring a gift or puts on the invitation that, you know, please don't bring gifts or however they, however they convey it as the guest, you're, you should honor their wishes. However, if you feel uncomfortable walking in empty handed, I recommend just bringing an, bringing a handwritten note 
congratulations on your new home. I'm really happy to celebrate this chapter of your life with you. Done. Very nice. It, it, Very nice. it will it will go a really long way and you're still honoring their wishes and you're still making yourself comfortable by because I don't, you know, we shouldn't show up empty handed to someone's home, right. even if they say no gifts. So right. that's the first that's good. First thing we can unpack. Second thing is I would recommend, although it's more work for you, having to write a thank you note to everybody that came. And even though you don't know who's, you know, whose gift was whose and who I would just write a, a thank you note, just thanking them for for celebrating your new home and spending okay. time with you. And although it's you'd like to acknowledge who gave you what gift yes, because yes. of this specific situation, you really can't. I would think that's the best solution, the the lesser of the evils, right? Because you yeah. you don't know and, and you don't want to write in the in the thank you note Thank you for the gift and give it to somebody who didn't give you a gift. And then that I know would be a that's huge what I'm, I'm going. Did she get me that bottle of wine or did yes. she? Bring, yeah. So it I would is. just write one, one kind of blanket statement saying, thank you for celebrating with us. Thank you for spending time with us. Done. Okay. Uh, one time I was having a dinner party. I remember, um, so it was just a dinner party. So no one, I wouldn't expect anyone, you know, sometimes people bring mm-hmm. a bottle of wine, but someone knew we were having guests. So they brought a box of breakfast pastries mm. to serve our guests the next morning, which I thought was so smart as an intermittent faster. I don't eat breakfast. Sometimes don't eat lunch. So that mm-hmm. wouldn't help me now. But I remember thinking if you have, especially if they have, they're hosting people, they're kind of overwhelmed. A good thing to do would be to help them out and say, you know, choice pastries, not a box of donuts, but it was choice yes. pastries from a bakery yes. and it was wonderful. I love that idea. I think that, you know, I advise people not to bring food or wine when they go to somebody's home unless oh. they've been asked to bring it. Okay. okay. And so some, if, if you are someone that does, you know, food is your love language, yeah. bringing something that they can enjoy the next morning is a really, really great idea. Okay. That's really good. Okay. Let's talk about uh, dinner parties now and setting mm-hmm. tables because mm-hmm. I had, I had one of those last week. I'm telling you, I'm all about the party now. That Lisa, people... I want to come to your parties. <laughs> <laughs> the masks are off and I am celebrating. I'm having another one and two. In fact, my friend always says, what are you doing now? I go, oh, I'm having another party. I'm planning another um, party. I love right. that. Yes. Cause it really brings me so much joy. Again, yes. I extrovert. That's my introvert daughter came when she, I had the two parties, the one to three and then the four to six. She came, of course, the last 10 minutes of the one to three with her kids. And she said, you're doing this again in an hour. <laughs> and I said, yes. Yeah. She goes, I think I have nausea. <laughs> you know, she's tired like, just looking at you. <laughs> oh, she just, she was like, this is a fate worse than hell to me. And I go, oh, I'm kidding. I mean, I was just nutty about it. But um, in a dinner table, I had um, 10 people around my rectangular table. Mm-hmm. We had already been served wine over here and our appetizers. Mm-hmm. So I didn't put wine glasses at their place settings. I just did water goblets. Mm-hmm. Should I've then done another red wine and white wine goblet at their place setting? Cause they've already chosen if they were red or white mm-hmm. in another area of the home, what should I've done? So I think it depends on what you plan to serve with your meal. So if you are planning to, so if you had already, you know, chilled a, a wine that you wanted to serve with the, I don't know, the fish that you were serving, okay. I would still set the table for, you know, with white wine glasses. And if they, your guests choose not to drink it and to stick to their red wine, you can always remove the glass. But I like to set the table to match your menu and what you plan to serve. Okay. Got it. And it's a salad fork, dinner fork. Mm -hmm. Um, Does the butter knife go with the tines, the uh, blade facing out and then the spoon to the right? So are you talking about the, like a butter knife? If you had a bread, if you had a bread plate? No, mm -mm. no, no, no. The, that butter knife, I think goes someplace else, you know, just your knife, not, not a cart. Cause I also had beef that night. So I did have to have steak knives for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think I did put it next to their knife that's on their place setting. Was that right? So we always, you know, like I said, we set our table almost like a roadmap of our menu and our utensils. Well, we work from the outside in based on our okay, courses. Right, right. And so, which is why, you, which is perfectly why you said, you know, the salad fork first and then the, mm-hmm. the dinner fork next. That's perfect. And then, you know, we keep our forks on the left and our knives and spoons on the right. Right. And then we would, you know, I wouldn't do a, butter knife or a dinner knife and a a serrated steak knife. I wouldn't do both of them. If you were serving, 
it depends on what you were serving. If you were serving beef that required a serrated knife, then you simply just set that one. So you don't want to give your, your guests anything extra that they won't be using. Okay. Then I did, because I did have that there and I Mm -hmm. put, um, a spoon. No, where do I, do I put my dessert fork on the top of the plate? Yes. And then where would I need? Dessert cutlery goes to the top. Dessert. Okay. Then where do you do Mm -hmm. just a teaspoon? Would that be a part of the place setting? If you, if your menu requires it. Okay. So if you won't be needing a teaspoon for what you were serving, we don't, we don't include it. So you literally just will look at your menu, look at each course. You know, if, if you were serving soup first, then you would obviously need a spoon that would go there. So that's, that's an example of something that, you know, where you would need a spoon. If you are serving ice cream for dessert, you'd need a spoon in the, in the dessert area, but otherwise you wouldn't have to put a spoon if, if, it, if your menu didn't require it. So only dessert color, cutlery goes to the north, <laughs> goes yes, to the front correct. of you. <laughs> correct. And you can remember that as it's, it's the furthest away from you. So it's the last pieces that you'll be using. Well, you know, in Europe, my aunt who lived in Europe and she came back to the States, anytime we would have her or she, anytime she would host us, they have their salad last. Yes. So she yes. didn't have the salad fork on the, on the outside of the left. So mm-hmm. that's that correct. So in be- a European place setting, or even in a, in a, just a very, very formal setting, you may see your smallest fork on the inside, which you're thinking, wait a second, that contradicts everything that I just explained, right? To work outside in. But oftentimes the, the, the salad is served last in that, in that case. Um, I love watching your social media because you really go to the basics. And one you had was about the napkin because yeah. the, the napkin, uh, we had them on our, uh, on our charger because the, mm-hmm. we had someone serving us. So he had the plates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On our mm-hmm. charger was the napkin in a napkin ring mm-hmm. and people pull it out and you pull it out and you put it on your lap. Right. But you had something about how it's folded and what, mm-hmm. and you had some little tricks. So kind of explain that. Sure. So when it comes to our napkins, like you said, it was in a napkin ring. So that's, it would be placed on the plate or the charger. If it was not folded in a fancy way or did not have a napkin ring, it would go to the left of our play setting. It wouldn't go on the plate. Right. Right. So that's the first, so that was perfectly correct what you did. And then we actually wait for our host or hostess to put the napkin on their lap if we're eating in their home. If you're eating at a restaurant, we put it on our lap as soon as we sit down. And then in terms of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm thinking. I was just visualizing. Okay, keep Mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how we put it on our lap, I don't have a, sorry, I don't have a napkin with me, so it's hard for me to to demonstrate, but we put the crease of the fold facing towards us and the opening of the napkin facing away from us. Got it. So that we can use the corner away from us to pick it up by the corner and use the inside of the napkin to dab our mouths and then close all the stains back in. And put it Got back it. in our lap so that Got all the, the stains are hiding on the inside. Yes. Uh, Darren, my producer, I know is listening and he's very visual and he's tracking, totally <laughs> track. Even if I didn't see your video, but you totally explained that a hundred percent perfect. Oh, um, good. Thank you. Now, if I am going, if I'm leaving my place setting, but I'm not finished, mm-hmm. where am I putting my napkin in relation to my plate and everything that mm-hmm. I'm coming back? On your chair. So if you are using the restroom or getting up to get air or getting up to greet someone or anything like that, we put it on our chair. Some people would argue that it's not sanitary, but according to to correct etiquette, that's where it goes on our seat. So where would they want you to put it? The non-sanitary people? Some people will argue that it goes on the table, but that's that's not until you're completely finished with your meal. If you're uncomfortable putting it directly on your seat where your bottom goes, you can always hang it over the arm or something like that. But, but correctly, it goes on the seat. And then I was always taught that the cutlery is facing one another in a, you know, like an X on mm-hmm. your plate when you're, you're signifying to anyone serving you that you are finished eating. Is that still 2022 accurate? So the, 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 little X or them like meeting in a V that or, signifies yeah. that you are taking a break. So you're not finished. You're just pausing. Oh, so oops. you're, you're drinking your water or you're going yes. to the restroom. Yes. And then, you know, the reason behind why it used to be crossed was it was a way to, you know, in medieval times, you put your fork over your knife to show that you 
weren't using your knife as a weapon. Now you can also <laughs> just it, it really they all have a, they all have a reason behind. Yeah, you can also right. just put them in a in a V like a okay. reverse V. And that signifies that you're taking a break. When we pick up silverware from our you know place setting, we don't ever want to put it back down on the table. So even if you're just pausing to take a drink of water or any or just pausing because you need a minute, that's the position that we put it in. And then if you're finished, then do they, are they side by side? Is that it? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Towards if if you, if you imagined your plate as a clock, they would face 11 o'clock. Right. And they're nestled together. Like, yes, you know, yep. Just like they're in love. They're in love. Your (laughs) fork and knife are in love. Okay. That's, which goes to, I always heard that the salt and pepper never divorce when you're Mm -hmm. passing them on the table. If Mm -hmm. someone says, please pass the salt, you're always to keep the salt and Mary, salt and pepper married as you pass it. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Sorority Live taught me something, you know, because we were all (laughs) together. There were a hundred of us that would have to eat dinner together on Monday nights. And I knew some of it. And so, and it was a traditional Southern college. So of Mm -hmm. course we learned these things. Do you think some of this is, um, divided by the Mason Dixon line that Southerners have a different type of etiquette than Northerners? In some, there's definitely a cultural difference in some ways, but when it comes to, you know, dining etiquette is dining etiquette, right? The rules are the rules. And so I think that it's, if you've learned them, doesn't matter where you're from. You know, I grew up in the Northeast and I did not grow up going to Cotillion. I did not grow up taking manners classes as a child. It just wasn't the culture here where I think that, you know, and and again, I can't make a blanket statement. I'm sure there are people in the Northeast that do participate in Cotillion, but where I grew up, it was not. It was the Kennedys. The, I mean, we could go yes. through some names. Of course, right. of course. I, I got you. But in, yeah. the, in the South, it's it's part of your, you know, early education to attend cotillion classes. And so, but again, that's just part of the culture. So I think in terms of, of the etiquette, it doesn't really differ because the rule is the rule. I think it's just a matter of what was common in where you grew up. Right. Okay. Cultural things. Mm-hmm. Your norms. Um, then how did you get involved in this age old <laughs> I mean, almost antiquated, but I adore every bit of it, (laughs) of what you're saying. Sometimes your peers probably look at you and go, what planet are you from? So how'd you get interested? I've always, always been interested in etiquette from a young age. I think I was always, not I think, I know I was always the kid obsessed with doing the right thing. That was something that I was always very passionate about. I was a rule follower. I was all about, you know, respect. And again, these, these traditional you know, manners and guidelines in which we're supposed to live by that just really did get lost in my generation. And so I I said, there's a way that we can bring back this, you know, lessons in civility and lessons in social awareness without making it stuffy, without making it so it's, you know, just for the royals or just for the wealthy. These are basic, basic ways that we should be, you know, living our lives with respect and kindness. And so I thought, you know, when, when I was, long story short, when I was living in in Manhattan at, you know, at my previous corporate job, I was in the fashion industry. When I started my career, I took etiquette classes in the city because it was just something that I enjoyed. It was something for me to do. And then I thought to myself, I could, I could do this. I could teach this because I'm so passionate about it. I had plenty to learn at the time, but I was very knowledgeable for, you know, what I've studied and read. And I love nothing more than helping people to, you know, feel confident in themselves and have the tools that they need to succeed. And so when you marry that all together, this was the perfect, the perfect path for me to be on. I I think you are just so endearing, so likable, and you you bring such a vibrancy and um, it's familiar for some of us, but for others, again, it is, it's new to them, but it's, it is, it's just a way of extending kindness and Mm -hmm. people knowing how to communicate. Um, Absolutely. So we're back to our dinner party. What if uh, someone mm-hmm. has food in their teeth? <laughs> you should tell them. Okay. You should tell them. Mm-hmm. That's actually a, a funny question that you ask because it's it's definitely a, an etiquette battle. It's a battle that mm-hmm. we have in, should we tell them? It's always that the boss example, right? My boss yes. has, has food yes. in their teeth. Do I tell them that they, that they do? Yes, the correct etiquette would be because again, it's about that social awareness. I would want someone to, to tell me and it's all in your delivery, right? It's mm-hmm. if you scream across the table to tell them that they mm-hmm. have food in their teeth, that's not, mm-hmm. that's not good mm-hmm. etiquette. But if we, you know, gently pull them aside, or just say, oh, I just want to let you know that you have some food in your teeth. Mm -hmm. Super, super, you know, Mm -hmm. under the radar, not embarrassing them. Yes, that would be correct. 
And then when you talk about living in Manhattan, you think about uh, all the etiquette there with riding the subway, mm, uh, mm-hmm. being on the street corner. That probably is an entire two hour I think so. <laughs> session for you because that's nothing. Now we don't deal with that here, obviously. We yeah. just have to be, uh, we have something called roundabouts. Now these mm-hmm. cities will have roundabouts. Mm-hmm. That's, that is our idea. That is our version of getting on the subway and go after you. No, it's my yes. turn. No, I, you've got the yield sign. No, I get to go. So that's where everybody, if, if anyone fusses, it's about how someone acted in the roundabout, <laughs> which uh, another thing we're known for in the South is mm-hmm. it's condescending when we say it, but when we say, bless your heart, bless your heart or bless his heart. What's the Northern version of that? You stupid idiot. <laughs> I think I, goodness, I don't think that it, that there is a right. replacement. I don't think it's that re- there is. Yeah. It's really passive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> when a Southerner says it, they really don't mean it. I have family in the South and I, I quickly learned, they explained to me the, the real meaning behind it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, the other thing Southerners do that I don't know if your people do it. And, you know, mm-hmm. I was born in Jersey, but I definitely developed Southern accent, Southern a lot mm-hmm. of southern. Th- I go back to the city and I start talking fast and I'm more <laughs> abrasive. But in the south, I eat okra and I do the things too in the south. Um, but that is, we take food. Someone is happy, we take food. Someone is sad, we take food. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a breakup, we take food. There, mm-hmm. you know, you, your dog ran away, we take food. Is that a mm-hmm. southern? Is that unique to southerners? I don't think so. I think that that's a you know, there's a very common thing up here called meal trains, and so if yeah. you know someone yeah. is. Yes. Same same thing. And so okay. I think that food is a love language for many cultures. And so especially the family that I that I come from, you know, my I am Italian on one side and and you know, Eastern European Jewish on the other side. Yes. And so we are food is our love language, right? Represent. So, <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. And so that's I think it's a beautiful thing to bring, you know, to someone. And I, I did a series on Instagram with a friend about doorstep drop offs. And so the idea of it being that you're not intruding, you're not, you know, bringing the food into their house. You're just simply ba- making a basket of things or baking a lasagna or whatever it is, and putting it on their doorstep and saying, "I dropped it off. It's there. It's there for you." It is. It is really such a help for people who are grieving and don't want to come and chitty chat. Um, yes. I a few years ago, my best friend's husband dropped dead suddenly on a Monday afternoon, and we'd been we were the Lucy and Ricky and they were the Ethel and Fred mm, of our mm-hmm. lives. You know, I called myself a sister wife. We handled every, I mean, they are as close to me as a brother. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, after that, um, on my website, Lisa Fisher said.com, I wrote uh, my own little epistle on what to do in a grieving situation. And one of the pet peeves, and I was on the radio then, so we talked to my radio listeners, called in and and chimed Mm -hmm. in. And one thing we all agreed is if someone has lost somebody or there's been a diagnosis of cancer or gotten terrible Mm -hmm. news, the last thing you should ever tell them is, hey, call me if you need anything. Hey, you got my number. Because during grief, and it was my best friend's husband, but we planned a lot and did a lot, locked arms with her. I couldn't think of who to call. You know, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have it in me. I didn't have the yes. energy. If you need me, call me. So yes. I've always said, you just show up with the food or you send yes. someone to clean the house yes. or you go out. We just plan it. We took up because it was January and still she had some summer annuals because she just comes. Sometimes we have warm winters like that. And so we just right. planted that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We tried to think and all of our friends tried to make decisions for her. Is am I accurate in saying please don't tell someone call me if you need anything? Absolutely, it's all about those unannounced gestures. Something that's like I'm thinking of you and I'm I'm here for you, but I'm not going to give you more you know work or give you more. It is it is more work. Yeah, anything like that, and also it, it saying call me if you need me is kind of like the the lazy way out, right? Mm-hmm. Saying I'm I'm here, but I'm not actually doing anything for you, right? Right, right. and so. Even if you leave a note on the food that you said and it, food that you sent and it said something like, you know, you at that point you could say, I'm a shoulder to cry on if you need anything, I'm here. But you've already done the gesture where you've brought the food, you've done the doorstep drop off. So it's still okay to say, you know, I'm a phone call away if you need anything, but after you've already extended completed the kindness. gesture. Yeah, I right. can see that. And it is, I think it it's... It's, it is, it's kind of a lazy way of saying, Hey, call me if you need me. 
Well, yes. no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. And grief, right. grief is such a unique time of mm-hmm. um, people will even say my best friend who lost her husband, she'll go, Oh, I don't remember things that happened during yes. that time. And that's where yes. your friends lock arms. We, we obviously in the Bible belt. So, you know, a lot of Christian community here of course. and just, or any, any religious community would lock arms with you. You mm-hmm. know, uh, I, I'm of Jewish faith. Uh, I'm a Christian now, but you know, Jewish descent myself, but the Muslims or whoever would lock arms and mm-hmm. lift up the person because the person really can't make the decision. So I guess that's yes. really was what I want to extend as a, some type of communication is they, they can't make decisions. They, they yes. don't know what their kids should even wear to the funeral. So you may have yes. to help with that. You, yes. you might have to send a housekeeper because the house may be a wreck and people are coming over. Mm-hmm. It's thinking Absolutely. beyond yourself and what you Absolutely. would want. So. Or even even saying something like, I'm I'm going to the grocery the store this morning. Send me yeah. your list. Yeah. Or something like that. And yeah. even if they, they can't get it together to send you the list, maybe you just drop off some basics so they have yeah. them. You put milk, eggs, and bread on the – just in case you needed them. Yeah. That's a great way to do it. Well, Mariah, I could talk to you for weeks. But, <laughs> Likewise. You know, we're both very important people who I've got to go babysit a couple of grandkids. So I have to go, but, um, I love your whole philosophy of what would Mariah do? WWMD. That's what our bracelet's going to say. And, um, <laughs> the link will be on social media, but everyone needs to follow you. You are a thank delight. You. And I know thank your parents you so are so proud of you. Uh-huh. And thank you. Listen to me, the Jewish mother and me. I know they're so <laughs> proud of you. Thank so. you, Lisa. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.